Trent, uh, you let me know when you're ready, and we'll begin with 12 minutes. You, whenever you whenever you start speaking, I'll, I'll just click the 12 minute timer. Sure. Yeah. Let's um, let's jump into this here. Uh, Alex, I'd like to talk about um, uh, the the point actually when you talked about the the raised eyebrows because I do think that the different intrinsic moral worths of human beings as opposed to other animals is a significant problem for atheism. That you made the claim that well, it's justified to kill animals, non-human animals, if one needs to do that in order to survive. And we would do the same for human beings. Now, I agree in the sense of self-defense, where if someone is trying to kill me, uh, my intention is not to kill them. It's to stop their fatal attack, even if um, I foresee it will kill them. It's the principle of double effect. But I think it's very clear that you cannot uh, kill another person merely to save your own life. There was a famous British maritime case called R.V. Dudley versus Stevens in 1884. Uh, It was about a group of sailors who were stranded at sea. I was just about to bring this up. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Then you you know about it. They killed the yeah. they killed they killed and ate the cabin boy Richard Parker. Which creepily enough, Edgar Allan Poe wrote a story about a cabin boy named Richard Parker being eaten sixty mm. years earlier. Uh, and the the court said there that no murder is not necessity is not a defense for murder. So would you agree that in some cases, just because you need to live, you don't have the right to kill another human being? Well, interestingly, the reason that I was going to bring up that example was uh, to to play on the intuition that they were actually justified in doing so, right? Because these were men in a boat who were all about to die. They were going to die anyway, and they would be dead uh, had they Mm -hmm. not committed this action. And the the cabin boy was ill. He was going to die anyway. Right. uh, And so they made that sacrifice. Now, don't get me wrong. This is not a nice thing to do. It's not like a blase. Yeah, it's fine. You know, you can survive. But the cabin boy didn't. He did. The point of the case is the cabin boy didn't volunteer himself. Uh, that's correct. Yeah. So he was he was murdered. It's you know even you know. So I, I guess that that it depends there. Depends on your definition I, of murder. I think it depends on your definition of murder because I the think Crown um, has said the, in this case. <laughs> the legal okay, so you so you yes, don't absolutely. see a yeah. you don't you so even though others may see this as an unjustifiable homicide, you just might be the minority view to dissent against that. I think it's at the very least a blurred case, and I think that that we that we can be quick to judge mm-hmm. somebody in that situation. Um, for the action they took, but I think that if you're in that situation, I think there's a, I think there's a fair argument to be made that it's a justifiable action to take. Okay, well let me change the situation a little bit. Suppose you're dying and you need a heart transplant, and there's someone who is also terminally ill that has a heart, but the problem is they're probably going to live for another six or twelve months, and you're going to kick the bucket in three months. Even though that person's going to die anyways, that wouldn't justify you killing them in order to take their heart so that you can live on for for many decades. Whereas in, whereas in almost all cases, we would be able to kill an animal for any reason to be able to live. So it seems to me we still have a big difference between how we treat humans versus how we treat non-humans uh, that I don't think can be explained if your criteria for morality is species neutral. Do you see the problem? I do, I do see what you're saying. Um, I think mm. those situations are different, and I wouldn't be in favor of people being able to harvest people's organs in that respect. Um, mm. do, I mean, do, uh, at least on first instance, one of the differences between these situations is that we don't want terminally ill people being worried that their organs are going to be harvested at a moment's notice, right? These situations, uh, these situations are not the same. True, but, but we, is, we might also... We, you... but, but also, Alex, we might want passengers on ships to not be worried they'll be eaten in lifeboats. I mean, this is true, but I think we can agree that this is such a rare occurrence that I don't think this is a, this is exactly, I mean, in other words, I don't think people are generally afraid that they're going to end up on a boat at sea that isn't going to be rescued and happen to be the person who's ill and about to die well, well, anyway. That, like, I, that I, was, I think this that is was a rare true now. That's true now, but it wasn't true 150 years ago. That was quite common for people at that time. Oh, I see. I suppose that's a fair. I don't know how common that would be at the time. I suppose that 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 may be it, fair. But it I, was kind the... of a dirty. It was a dirty secret of maritime travel that everyone tolerated until the Dudley case. Right. So, I guess let me let's just we'll put that there. I mean, morality is. I think when we talk about this, morality is probably one of the most interesting things for people to wrap their heads around. So we'll we'll talk more about it. Uh, but let me actually. Well, morality, evil, that kind of fits in there. Um, 
your argument from evil, uh, it was a probabilistic one that you saw. It doesn't disprove God, but it makes them unlikely because there's some evils that I, you don't see how they could be justified or they appear to be gratuitous. So is your argument that it's the gratuitous evils that should make us skeptical of God or, or all evils? It's just a subset of the evils. Is that correct? Yeah, no, I definitely don't think that the existence of, of evil, or perhaps I should frame it as suffering to suffering. avoid certain complications, is a problem in itself. I think it's the extent and the depth of the suffering. And that's the point that I was trying to make by saying that uh, I believe that, you're, that you would be actually committed, despite what you said in your rebuttal, to the view that we do have exactly uh, the exact right amount of suffering in, in, in the world. Um, because... Look, I mean, if you want to, and, and bear in mind, my argument was specifically to respond to a defense of the of the existence of suffering. So people who say that suffering exists right. because God has morally sufficient reason. You said a second ago or a moment ago, you said mm -hmm. that uh, God could create uh, more suffering or less suffering. There would just yes. be more or less good. But yes. my understanding of a perfectly moral being is one which maximizes morality, one which maximizes the good wherever it's possible to do so. Now, I understand why you'd have a limitation on a maximally perfect being in getting rid of, say, all suffering. That wouldn't make any sense. As you say, if there are such things as higher order goods or goods which require certain suffering, such as free will, then it makes perfect sense. Well, uh, I would just, well, 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 Alex, what I would say is I would disagree with that as assertion that a perfectly good being must maximize the good that you and I would agree there is no such possible world that, that has an intrinsic maximum of the maximum good, because you could always make more and more people, and then you would lead to some kind of contradictions. For example, suppose there was a world with one million people, and they have, uh, let's say, 99% happiness. Would you say that's a that's a good world? Yeah, I, I, I see where you're going with this. Um... Well, let me just keep going because not everyone will be as clairvoyant as you. Yeah. So then what if we did 2 million people at 98% happiness? Yeah, see, I don't know the answer to that question, but that doesn't mean that there isn't an answer. Right, look, I don't, for, for a start, I don't think that, um, mm -hmm. I don't think that the quantity and quality, or, or quantity and, let's say, uh, amount of, of pleasure, uh, the amount of pleasure that someone receives and the quantity of people receiving that pleasure are on the same kind of pedestal here. For instance, I think that one person experiencing 2x suffering is worse than two people experiencing x suffering. Um, like, I, do, I don't think they kind of map onto each other in, in, in the same way. Hmm. Okay, so I'm trying to get a handle around what you would but, say. Now, you know, what's interesting here, though, is when we're talking about evil, uh, about the moral duty that God has. So if God creates a world, I'm trying to get my head around for you. There's two questions here. What would be the contents of the moral duty? We can put that in quotation marks. And then two would be the, the epistemic foundation. Uh, sorry, the ontological foundations. Like, where do these moral duties come from? So like, if God makes a world... Uh, is it just maximizing pleasure or is it minimizing suffering? Like they, they could be incompatible. How would they be incompatible? Well, for example, if the goal is just to minimize suffering, then God can make a world with an electron and then there's zero suffering. Right. Yeah, I see what you mean. Um, so I think that generally speaking for conscious creatures that do exist, the minimization of suffering and the maximization of pleasure are kind of two sides of the same coin. And some people prefer to fr frame it in terms of maximization of pleasure, some people minimization of suffering. Mm. You could just say that you want uh, a balance of both. But look, I, I see what you're saying, which is that there can't be, like it, it's difficult to imagine what the perfectly moral or, or the worst possible uh, world would look like. But my point is just this. My point is that it seems almost trivial, trivially true that there could be at least some less suffering in the universe. Yeah. And if there's sure. not- Sure, and I agree, I, I agree with you. And, I agree and so I, I wonder what your what your reasoning would be or what your suggestion would be as to why it's not the case. And what I would say to you is, does some suffer is suffering? Can suffering be justified? Yes. OK. OK. So uh, then, let, me, let me reframe then. I, I think that there can be I think that there can be less unjustified suffering in the world than there is right now. Then what criteria do you use to determine whether a suffering is justified or unjustified? What objective criteria do you use? All right, so to be clear, I'm I'm talking in, in terms of your worldview here. So whatever you mm -hmm. take to be the criterion of good, I think either, and, and again, you, you can reject this claim. So I'll say that whatever your criterion of good is, I'm asking the question, could there mm -hmm. be less unjustified suffering? And if the answer is yes, then I think you've run into a problem. If the answer but, is no, then I think you've accepted but, the best but of the But Alex, under, under my, right, but Alex, under my view as a theist, I do not believe unjustified suffering exists at all, because I believe any suffering can be justified by greater goods or the prevention of greater evils. So on my view, I don't see that as a problem. But yeah, well, for that's, you, that's, if, that's precisely if, my point. 
the, I mean, I mean say that, that that's precisely the point that I made. Maybe maybe we're, we're talking past each other here a little bit, but my point was to say that mm -hmm. the theist believes that any instances of suffering or what people would generally call natural evil are not in fact evil at all. Like these aren't because they're not I, I, unjustified suffering. Or, okay, no, you, no, I, I, I don't I don't hold that view. I, my view is that evil is a lack of good. Uh, there are intrinsic evils, uh, things that one must never do, but evil itself is just an absence of good. There can be non-moral evil and moral evil. There can be moral evils that we tolerate and moral evils that we must never tolerate or never engage in. So it'd be a richer dichotomy here. Matt, how much time do I have? Sorry about that. You have one minute and 50 seconds. Okay, um, well, let's go to the basement then of these uh, about morality and moral duties, because my argument was if moral realism is true, God exists, moral realism, therefore God. Um, it's a valid argument. And based on your comments and the debates, would you hold to premise one? Uh, what the moral realism is true or that moral realism entails if, God? If moral realism, um, then God. I... I, I'm not sure about that because I, I, I don't think that I, I'm not a moralist. I don't think that moral claims can be objectively true. Um, and I think I would hold that that would be the case even if God existed. So I'm not sure I can accept that claim. And I can explain why if you'd like. Okay, so you believe moral realism is simply an impossible state of affairs? Depending on exactly what you mean by moral realism. For instance, I think that a claim like you ought not murder doesn't have truth value. Okay, so it's it's just um, an utterance or, or disapproval of certain kinds of killing. Uh, I would interpret it slightly differently, but essentially, yes. Okay, it, so it's essentially a motive. It's a form of emotivism or non-cognitivism, I guess you could say. But it's it's potentially a bit more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. So you would say that when it comes to morality, it, uh, there are the statement "rape is always wrong," or let's take the most foundational one, the statement humans ought to promote human flourishing, uh, you don't believe those statements are true? Uh, I think that perhaps a statement of something being good can be true because that's a, a descriptive claim, but an ought claim contains an essence of command and commands can't have truth value. So I don't think that can have truth value. Okay. I have no, so, so I have no problem if there's a, if there's a moral author of the universe and that God uh, and, and that God determines that okay. something is good, I think that's there. perfectly, I think that's perfectly coherent. Um, mm -hmm. However, I'm not sure uh, I would say the same for ought statements, okay. which, I I in other words, but have prescriptive it, it, uh, content. We, if, it turned, just, if it turned out, though, there what, were... What we, sorry, what, what, let's, do we'll you want to ask the final question? 12 minutes are up, or should we... Mm, we can switch. That's okay. fine. All right. Uh, just trying to be fair to both of you here. Okay, so Alex, uh, as soon as you start, I'll click the 12-minute timer, and you can cross-examine Trent, and you can interrupt him at any time to move move the conversation along. Sure. Well, I'm... I'm uh, uh, I'd be happy to, to further that discussion perhaps in another another point because like it, it takes 10 minutes just to get it off the ground because we have to understand exactly what we mean by different moral mm -hmm. uh, moral terms. Um, so I'm interested just to be just to be clear about this talking about animal suffering. I'm interested Trent what mm -hmm. do, do you think for example um, okay well let me just put the question like this why do animals suffer as much as they do in your view? why do animals suffer the current amount that they suffer? Yeah. Well, I would say animals suffer the current amount that they suffer because our universe has regular, fixed, and predictable laws of nature, and that animals are finite physical creatures uh, that have to operate in that environment. And so in order to operate uh, as complex organisms, the higher order animals will need survive. They survive best when they have pain sensors to determine threats to them, and it allows their they evolve to have pain sensors to increase their ability to survive and propagate. Sure. But it's so that would be my answer. It's at least possible that th those animals could could have experienced less suffering. Like, do you, do you think it's? In other words, what I'm asking is, am I expected to kind of interpret that as you think it would, would have been logically impossible for God to have created a functional set of natural laws that didn't entail the amount and depth of animal suffering that it currently does? Uh, no, I don't think it's logically impossible. I mean, you could create... The, the, re the, the reason I ask, sorry, is, is because if you say that the reason why this animal suffering uh, exists, uh -huh. or at least one reason, is because of the fact that there are natural laws which entail it, well... If mm. if those natural laws aren't necessarily the case, then why not have just made them differently? That that's not really a justification for for the for the problem at hand. Well, you 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 didn't ask for justification. You only asked a, a a descriptive question. Why are things the way that they are? 
Okay, I suppose uh, implicitly I mean to say, why are they that way, uh, assuming uh, that there is a morally perfect supervisor of the universe? Why would he allow that to occur? Well, for the, the same reason as the, the theist's overarching defense, which would say that any evil and suffering, whether it's human or non-human, uh, an all-powerful being can allow the existence of evil if that being can bring greater goods from it or prevent greater evils. That for me, it seems very clear that if this principle applies to humans, uh, that we do this all the time where we allow uh, you know, we, we allow evil to exist and suffering among humans and non-humans to secure certain greater goods. If we allow humans to do that in limited circumstances, it, I don't see a problem in allowing an omnipotent, omniscient creator to have far more latitude to do it. And also the reasons he would have, uh, I don't really have epistemic access to all of them because I'm a limited, finite creature. But given that it does work for humans, uh, I don't see why it wouldn't work for God. That was why I brought up that thought experiment about vaporizing the earth when humans leave. I, I think many people would, would leave the earth as kind of a zoological habitat for those animals, even knowing that they would suffer because there is a goodness just in them existing. Well, unless you could create a system whereby they're existing with less suffering. Like if you had that option, surely that would be the option to take. Well, uh, I mean, I, I, in uh, other words, let, let, let me put uh, it this way. If, if I mm -hmm. gave you that option, we're, we're moving away in this spaceship and I say, look, you've got three options here, Trent. You can either abolish all life on Earth as we move away from it. You can keep things ex exactly as they are, or you can create a kind of paradisal Earth where animals are existing with at least a lot less suffering, maybe no suffering, if, if you like. Which button do you press? Well, no suffering would be would be different. The terms would be vague. Is it... Um... If there still is suffering, even minimal suffering, after millions of years, that would be an incredible amount of suffering. Uh, okay, even so let just... me put it this way then. Um, mm -hmm. There's a button which, uh, mm -hmm. which reduces the amount of suffering by 50% overall. With with no with no kind of non beneficial side effects, right? right. With, with no, no kind, I of, would, kind of effect well, down Alex, from my, the line that are going to make my pers so my personal view my personal view on the matter is that I believe the existence of animals is a good thing. Uh, so. Maybe I would push that button. Maybe I wouldn't. I might need more data as to what it what it means to reduce but the suffering. So, for surely, example, I mean, by it, pushing it seems... by pushing the button, like does it it keeps everything the way it is? I guess my my trouble with this is that, uh, it, yeah, it's possible to create a feasible world where it's the exact same, but there's less suffering. My concern is that it, that may not be feasible. It might be the, like the problem of philosophical zombies. Yeah, like sure. making... so, now, so now you're toying with the idea that maybe the amount of suffering in the universe is exactly how where it needs to be. And that's what I was uh, that, that's what I was putting forward in the first place, that what I think your view commits you to. I think you mm. either have to say that the amount of suffering in the universe mm. cannot be budged one way or the other, or you have to okay, well, here's, can, sure. we have good sure. reason to say that it should go one way. I think well, here's how, I would, here's how I'd if, answer if, that. Here's how I'd answer. You, if, I, if I give you those buttons and mm. you refuse to press the button, or, or at least even can say, well, I don't know what I, but maybe I'll just let them go on suffering. Maybe I won't press this button, which has no other effect but to give them less suffering. Like, I think that would be, I think that would be a moral travesty not to press that button. But then will you agree, though, that the button that results in no suffering, I'm not, ob I'm not obligated to pick that because it ends the animal's existence. And you agree that's a mis that's a harder case. Well, yes, that's a harder case. It may be the case that we should press that button if the suffering is bad enough and if the suffering isn't counterbalanced by pleasures. Right. It, but that's let's that's just say it's the, the way of this question. Right. But ultimately, what I would say is my choosing to push any of those buttons will be undergirded by a particular. I would say that it's not under your view that morality is about subjective yeah. assumptions we have about what the good is. I could just tell you, Alex, I have a different subjective assumption about the ultimate foundation of morality. I don't believe it's a utilitarian maximization principle. Uh, so I'm not under a moral duty to press any of them because it's your opinion against mine. But my view yeah. actually allows there to be universal moral duties saying that it is a fact we ought to act certain ways. And I, and I think that's a huge deficiency uh, yeah. on atheism. I, I see what you're saying, and this is, this is just a point about conflicting kind of base worldview beliefs here. And I, I, sure. I want to move on to talk about something else briefly here. I hope my point has got across. But as I say, sure. I'm happy to uh, continue discussing this any time. I should go to um, London and have one of those delightful backyard conversations with you like you do with um, your friend, what's his name, Woodford, Stephen? Stephen, yeah, that, that yes. would be good. Or, or on the podcast. Um, sure. I'm... Uh, one thing I want to ask about is the principle of sufficient reason. Now, now it seems to me that you're quite influenced by Ed Faser's arguments. Um, I, I may be kind of pulling that out of thin air, but from what you said, they seem to have a lot of correlation. Now, I'm interested mm. if, if you follow his reasoning in, in, in one of the ways that I'm thinking about here. Um, mm. In the argument from motion or the argument from actualization of potential, 
Uh, Phaser makes the point that uh, whatever actualizes, you know, the thing that actualizes this mic being here on the stand is the stand, but the stand only holds that actualization um, mm -hmm. uh, instrumentally because that's actualized by something else. And so it's it, the actual, the, the full explanation for what actualizes the microphone is not the stand because that only has instrumental um, uh, right. actual actualization via mm -hmm. other things in the same way. I, I would say that the sure, same sure. should, in, in my interpretation, be true of the principle of sufficient reason, that is, uh, if a contingent fact is explained by another contingent fact, that contingent fact is also explained by another contingent fact. So the thing that explains whatever contingent fact we're looking at is only instrumentally uh, explanatory, only has instrumental explanatory power. For it to be a sufficient explanation is in pr principle of sufficient reason um, to explain why a contingent thing is the way that it is. Um, you may disagree with my reasoning here, but let me try and let me try and spell this out. Um, we're trying to say that there needs to be a sufficient reason for why and why something exists, right? Mm -hmm. But if that, if the if the reason or the explanation for that thing also re also requires an explanation, then in the right. same way as actualization, that explanation is only instrumentally explanatory. You see what I'm saying? It's kind of by analogy, it's also only instrumental in its explanation in that that needs to be explained by something else and that needs to be explained well, by well, something Well, that's the nature, of con the nature of contingent things or the nature yeah. of things that are a mixture of act and potency is that if the thing does not explain itself, it's quite capable of explaining other things, but we don't have a complete explanation of the state of affairs because yeah, so, uh, we're, so, we're stuck at something that still needs explanation sure so when you say that anything has a sufficient reason that is uh, a reason that's all encompassing and, and explains everything that to me would imply that you would need to have all of the instrumental um e explanations and the base root explanation be it whatever brute fact you think it goes back to which to me makes it seem like the the argument for the principle of sufficient reason is begging the question because to say that something has uh sufficient reason is essentially to say that you have an explanation which uh, ultimately terminates in a brute fact, that is to uh, assert the existence of the brute fact before you get off the ground. I don't know if I'm making sense here. I haven't explained this very well. Um, <laughs> no, well, well it, I would say that, that when it comes to explaining things, we can have sufficient explanations you can have a sufficient explanation that is not a complete explanation. For example, when I left the house today, I saw there were a plate of cookies on the table. And so mm -hmm. I would think, well, why is there a plate of cookies? There's a scientific explanation that dough he heated in the oven to make a confectionery delight and a reasonable personal explanation. My wife, Laura, made them. But I right. mean, a total one would be like the bread that was harvested, the cocoa that was made, the oven that was constructed, going all the way back to the Big yeah, Bang. But that, I mean, that, that seems to be what you would need to actually have a fully sufficient explanation of why this contingent thing is as it is. Um, but but also, I just well, want to flag this no. before we run out of time. Look, the, the sure. distinction you've made there, I think, is a false one. You make a distinction between scientific and personal explanations, like boiling uh -huh. the kettle. You say, why sure. do you boil the kettle? Well, there's the explanation involving chemistry and there's the explanation involving um, what I want. But me wanting a particular type of drink or something is also scientifically explicable, right? By like, like that, that is all, I, I don't see why that's different just because it involves a person like the, Mm -hmm. the, the reasons, the neurons that are firing in my brain to make me want a particular thing rather than another is just as easily scientifically explainable as well, the chemistry well, what, of the... Right, of, but of what I would say kettle, is that... Right? Well, what I would say is that endorses a controversial view of the philosophy of mind that even many atheists don't accept, which is that uh, mental inten that intentions or mental experiences don't exist. Alex Rosenberg makes this point uh, in his book, The Atheist's Guide to Reality, that uh, an intention would be having aboutness to something. But in my wife's yeah. brain, uh, the neurons, the electrons that are firing, uh, there's no property of aboutness or chocolate chip cookies, about chocolate chip cookies, in there. So if the only thing that exists are these material objects, we haven't really explained uh, that crucial element of it if you try to reduce mental states and intentions just to a materialist explanation, which even many atheistic philosophers of mind don't do. They can be property dualists and other things like that. Yeah. Um, well, I think that looking at my timer, I think we've pretty much run out of time about on this 30, section. 40 right? seconds. Oh, 40 seconds. Okay. Well, I was just getting ready to, to pipe can down. Wrap up do I have any Abor more questions? Abortion. <laughs> I don't know. But, um... <laughs> it's quite, I, I did see someone, I, I, I've been glancing over at the live chat, and I remember when I said, you know, I can't, I can't talk about or justify abortion one way or the other in four seconds, and someone was like, yes, you can. <laughs> not, not, quite... not in an intelligible, <laughs> befitting way. We'll have, yeah, to, maybe, we'll have to save not. that for another discussion. For sure. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm happy to move on to audience Q&A, if that's sure, what sure. comes next.
Thank you for watching this clip. You can click here to watch the full episode. And I want to say a big thanks to our sponsors and to our amazing patrons for making all of this possible. Please do us a favor before you go, click that subscribe button and then the bell. And that way YouTube will be forced to let you know every time we put out a new episode.